um, so we are back. What? So we are back to the same group. I mean, to the central room now, so that we can continue the meeting. All right. So, uh, so let's listen to Austin from Birmingham University, UK. Austin, your audio is not on. Augustine, sorry. Hi, everyone. Okay. My name is Augustine Parola, and uh, the title of the presentation uh, to be given is Digital Humanities and Computer Assisted Texture Analysis. And um, um, actually, I, I am in the area of texture analysis, and my current PhD work is actually working on texture analysis. And some of the um, data and some of the ways in which I share some of what I do is also through some online platform like afrothingitry.com and also a digital humanity project, which is Paint Me Black, in which I'd be able to get data and analyze them in this form as visual. And presently, for like minds of digital humanity who are textual uh, scholars, we actually have a creative techies forum where we all meet to learn programming languages in order to, to do some text analysis. Um, let's go to text analysis itself. The question that we first of all ask ourselves is, what is the data that we use in the humanities or in the digital humanities or the objects of our research? And if we accept that text is the data and that is the object of our research, then we'll come to realize that as many scholars have actually argued that whatever you are making your research on, whatever you obtain as your data is actually digital. Let it be text, let it be image, let it be sound. And whichever discipline you find yourself, if you don't start seeing whatever you are using for your research finding as data, it's going to be problematic. But if you see them as data, you ask yourself, what is the method or what are the methods that I use to analyze this? And for the sake of this presentation, we notice that we are taking text as data. And if, if we talk about text as data, you say, actually say, where do I get text from? Maybe from the books that you read, from, by scrubbing from the internet, by uh, collating whatever you obtain from questionnaires from people, and your job as a digital humanist, or a digital humanist or a humanist will be to find a way to collect them together and ask yourself, what are the methods am I, or which, which method, or what are the methods I'm going to deploy in responding to them? On the slide, I have some kind of uh, 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 points highlighted from the work of some scholars based on their arguments on should we accept text as data in the humanities, or how do we accept text as data in the humanities? And uh, we have that. Why some scholars are saying, forget about it. Whatever you are doing, it's all about data. And humanists will focus more on text. And you ask yourself, what are the method or what are the methods that I use to retrieve, to store, and to analyze those data? And that's one of the things that we take a look at. Presently, as someone has alighted, where people have data that people analyze or scholars analyze presently are called corpus. Corpus would be like what Professor Kwebi has done on the, the corpus of political discourses. Corpus would be when you assemble uh, things or uh, where we can say literature or text from that discuss a particular kind of a thing and then you make it available online through. Uh, so we have a lot of corpus, we have British corpora, uh, we have uh, many other forms. So the research you want to do, we affect the kind of corpus you want to look for. And a lot of, like for instance, someone asked in a previous session, based the corpus for philosophy, there are a lot of corpus online. Though so the question may be as a professor, uh, the, second, the professor from Cameroon has actually highlighted that do we have African corpus? And that's what Professor Pepe said they're currently working on. We also have what we call repositories. And this year, data that people have used or data that people have collected, they make it available. An example is that of Harvard Dataverse, which you can visit and actually get data uh, for your own research in order to obtain 
uh, uh, information about a particular subject matter you want to investigate. We also have the RE3data.org where you can also check and look at what are the data do we have here and can I get the one for a particular research and then so once you have data that you there are still once you, there are still other ways in which you can get data uh, some people want to be like involved in um, analyzing this force in the system or you want to get evidence for your argument by relying on this course in the social media. Twitter has been a very good tool mm -hmm. and based on its API or the way it's structured, mm -hmm. it allow people to easily mine. And without knowing how to code at all, you can use softwares like our app that are available online like Twitonomy, which you can, you will get the slides, this PowerPoint, which you can, so you can use Twitonomy to actually see what's going on, what are they, what are they saying in Nigeria concerning Corona? What is this talking about generally? What are they talking about in other places? What's the dominant and check the trends and be able to access the data. We also have the no community. We also have the audience. Uh, we have the audience. So you can use this ones or track my hashtag. You can use that one if you feel that you you want to rely on obtaining data from uh, social media. EcoSec is also available. But the one, the, the, the method that scholars have actually encouraged and which most scholars in developed nations as well as developing nations are using is scrubbing, is doing it themselves, trying to, to get it done, trying to go online, code, instruct the computer, tell the computer what to get for you. It could be you want to scrub an entire website. It could be you want to get these courses on, um, on colonial, uh, matters that are available online. So there are, with simple codes, you can actually get those things done. And there are a lot of tutorials online too that you can actually obtain. So that's on obtaining your data. Now, when you have your data, the question you ask yourself is, how do I analyze the data? Now, there's a chart here. Uh, there's a chart here that I've actually uh, obtained from uh, the work of, of uh, Laura K. Nelson, and she actually gave this chat in one of our presentation, which I actually quote. And the chat asks the fundamental question. When you have your data, now you have, you want to embark on a research and you have the digitized version of the data, what do you want to do with it? Now, these are question and answer if and then. Now, you see from the chat, like if you start with, do I have a digitized test? And if that, your answer is no, then you can't do any form of text analysis, just forget about it, because you have to have it digitized. Then if it's yes, then the question is, am I interested in the content of the text? Now, if the answer is still yes, then am I looking for specific categories or themes? Now, if, if the answer to that one is yes, you still ask yourself, if I'm interested in categories or themes, are the categories mutually exclusive? And if the answer to that one is yes, then you embark on the methodology they call classification. It's a form, or is a, is a method under textual analysis in digital humanities. Now, if you look at the other steps, you realize that sometimes if you say no, within the progression, like let's say for instance, you have a digitized text and you are interested in that, you can look at whether you're doing clustering, you want to do topic modeling, or you want to do dictionary method. So when you are now presenting the research, you'll be able to say this is the method that you are deploying. And when you know the method you want to deploy for your research, you'll be able to ask which tool am I going to use? And how do I embark on this? How do I get this done? Um, let's move to the next slide. Um, the automated form of text analysis, like I collected some of the researches that people have been doing along that category. You realize that the dominant uh, methodology that they use could be classification, um, dictionary method, difference of proposition. Maybe they are looking at writings in a particular century with the writing in a particular century, or what we can say test frequency, you know, and we have clustering and topic modeling. Now, you, you will ask what are all this all about? We, we actually address some of them. 
I want us to take note of this. If we as scholars, you as digital humanists, who actually want to, we have text, we have newspapers, we have uh, even written text that we can scan and turn to a digital form. Then when we want to bring out our research out as uh, a research in text analysis, uh, foreign scholars have already uh, in text analysis have identified certain things which we should take note that will make the work to be accepted. The force is the standardized, we have to standardize it. And what do what we mean? That's with regards to the text. So the, the text we, we want to use, if you're going to use Boyan 2, you want to use Ant Kong, you want to use many other two, the text, the, the text that you will use should be the same across all of them. If you want to, so that you'll be able to confirm. If I pour uh, maybe the work of Wale Shoyinka or into, let's say, Voyant, the same work I can point into anchor, the same work I can point into, or I can even interrogate with them directly with code, but you should make sure that, because they will ask you at the end of the day, if they want to review your research, that, that can you show us your data? And then it should be open. And when we talk about varied, it, it should be selected in such a way that you won't say, okay, we want to look at the right. use of cutting words in a particular century, and you select just within, a range of people, maybe you want to do a survey in Nigeria, or a digital humanity survey, or what happened in the civil war, you have to ensure that you pick from all the sides and various tribe or ethnic group in such a way that whatever you come up with can actually be objective. Now, when we come to the analysis, it's, you should be able to identify that this is the tool I want to use. And when you use the tool, you make it possible that it's replicable, that people can be able to now pour whatever or test run whatever finding you have come up with and be able to say, we have done it on our side. This objective is, is a little bit, we can also, and you say, okay, there is racism in uh, American soccer. And you look at the way in which newspapers have, you have collected some newspapers that are talking about American uh, 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 so, uh, players. And you want to look at, the way they use certain words attached to blacks and the way they attach it to whites, you'll be able to, when you have that done, you'll be able to ask yourself uh, various questions. Do I provide the data in a varied way, in a replicable, in a standardized way that other people will accept the finding that I come up with? As uh, Rockwell did in the, in the book, Hermeneutical, they were able to defend that, come, there are racist words that I use towards American black uh, or African American players. Now let's go into to what we call CATA, which is computer assisted text analysis. As I explained earlier on, you can do text analysis even without using computer. Like some people want to sit down and count the number of time uh, Ch Chino Achebe mentioned Okoko in Things Fall Apart. So they can sit down with it and be counting, but computer can do that. Or if you want to look at how, why, use certain word or how the guy used the Zen or you want to look at in history, you want to look at um, uh, the, the, the understanding of certain concept. So you can do that by counting manually, but that will take a long, a, lo a long period of time. And what we now talk about is computer assisted text analysis, computer can help us. And how will computer help us? We should have it at the back of our mind that it's not the same thing as we are entrusting it to the hand of computer. It can give us formalized, or it can formalize our research in forms of visual representation. It can give us a, uh, uh, in form of quantitative way that you can say I, you, it's able to count this out. And as Clement, T. E. Clement uh, explained, that with most of those uh, computer assisted text analysis technologies that we have, the efforts to extract, count, stem, pass you know, this ambiguity, collocate, contextualize. And when you start experimenting with some of them, like some, most of the scholars on the platform, most of them has listed some of those tools in the chat room. When you start experimenting with them, you can't realize, oh, this thing are actually giving me uh, what I want. So I'll move very, uh, in the, in the, in, I will uh, fast and I'll move very fast now and jump some things in order to meet up with the time. Text analysis, is for all discipline in the humanities. Because everything we do, whether we are comparing and contrasting, whether we are uh, uh, explaining, whether we are 
uh, whatever we are doing with any text in our hand, it's actually to arrive at meaning and interpretation. And that is essential to, to the, disciplines, the disciplines in the humanities. And computers are available to do those tasks. Now, what, uh, what are some of those tools that uh, can be used? Most of the tools that I imagine on the digital humanity often have uh, what we call theoretical framework. Like the, 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 the Stanford lab, which is the lab of some humanity scholars who are actually developing tools or doing some things to be able to show how we analyze text. They try to give a kind of a, a philosophical or epistemological idea underpinning their tool. And then we have two dominant view. We have that being held by macro uh, analysis by Marty Joker, and then the popular distant reading by Franco Moretti. Now, distant reading, we can say distant, when, when, when you are analyzing text using technology, Franco Moretti say what you are doing is you are reading too, but it's not the same thing as close reading that people have been doing without using technology. And te the technologies that form under the heading of distant reading, as we know, Voyant is one of them. Voyant, you don't need to code. The, the Voyant tool is something as a uh, Dr. James Yekur has also mentioned earlier on that it has documentation. When you go online, you check Voyant, you see the documentation, you'll be able to practice, and it's so simple. Assemble your, the text that you have gathered that you want to analyze and put that into it. Another essential part is Tapol uh, Porter, which I will explain today, Methodica, as well as the use of Python or R uh, programming language for text analysis. So this Voyant, you, 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 you get voyant, you pour whatever text you want to have inside it, it gives you this interface, and then you, you understand some of the interface, the, 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 the function that this interface actually performs. It's like giving you multiple windows at the same time, but it will help you to actually generate the word cloud function, as well as keyword in context. You'll be able to see in which way we, on, inside this text as the, the author used the word man, like I just, just did for stomach theology, the, the work of Thomas Aquinas, the philosophical work. Uh, and I try to look at how did he use man and in which context. And then you type that. You can try that with any of the word. It also gives you visualization, as we have said, uh, that what computers actually do for digital man is also it gives them some kind of formalization, the kind of things that actually project to the to, to, to the to the to the listeners or the part the people who are assessing their research that is objective or it has arrived through certain quantitative measure. We also have uh, tables too being generated just with the use of that too. And for me, I see the two as a conglomeration of existing digital humanity tools that are available for people who don't even, any scholar who don't know anything about programming and whatever you come up with, it will just be perfect as a work of digital humanity. Now, the other aspect I'm, I'm going to is, I'm going to introduce Tapo Collection. Tapo Collection is a portal by uh, Gregory uh, Rockwell and Sinclair with other scholars. They assemble over 1,500 tools that are available for text analysis. And when you, when you open the, the, the tuple.ca, uh, when you open it in your browser, the first window you see is this. And then you'll be able to see what do I want to do. You know, we talk about the methodology one way deploy when you have your text. Is it capturing? Is it collocation? Is it content analysis? Is it dissemination? You'll be able to ask yourself, what do I want to do? And when you click on that, it will show you available tools that, uh, that you can actually use. And, um, we also have Methodica. Methodica was also developed by a philosopher, uh, Gregory Rockwell, with Sinclair too, and it's open that if you want to contribute. Methodica is uh, not a place where we have all the tools, but we have the recipe, as if you want to prepare a soup. So when you, have, when you want to do a particular research- uh, You have two minutes. You okay. have two minutes, please. Thank you so much. So when you want to do a research and test analysis, when you go to methodica.ca, when you say, for instance, you want to do, uh, 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 you want to do machine, uh, compare text or do accurate analysis of sentiment to tell you the ingredients, that these are the things, and to show you step by step how you will do that. So I have in the slides, tokenization using LTK. So you have the recipe like guidance 
and what you need to learn to be able to deploy this methodology. I also include in the slides links to, to where we can do that. Now, finally, I will introduce Python, and we have an ongoing, uh, there are a lot of materials to online about the use of Python for, for but if, if you don't, if the tool cannot give you what you want, as many people have argued, most of these two don't even understand Yoruba or Ausa, or understand most of the African language. You can also talk to the to the to the material yourself using using uh, Python pro, uh, programming language, which or R programming language, who can help you to generate this sort of visualization too, as uh, some of those tools also. And the beauty of Python, why I personally use Python, is it's, you don't need to write a lot of things. With two lines of code, you can generate a lot of things because it contains what we can say libraries or modules, codes that people have written for you that you can just invoke and it will get it done. One of them is Mallet, the other is Natural Language, uh, LTK, and then we have the beautiful soup and text blog. And uh, at this point, we may not be able to uh, do justice within the time limit to what is uh, what we how we engage or analyze this, but there are lots of materials online, and you can always reach out. So we ask yourself, if you are not interested in most of all these things, don't feel left out. Digital humanity is not just about building two things, according to Stephen Ramsey, but also includes those who theorize about the building, those who design so that others might build, those who supervise the building. So you can even call programmer, you can do collaborative work. You can say, you want to work on this, you know programming, let's work on this. You are a historian, I'm an archaeologist, you are a linguist, let's work on this together. So at this point, I say thank you very much for listening.